Well, thank you for the introduction, and uh, thanks for everyone for making this uh, popular 8.50 in the morning uh, session with me. Uh, this is joint work with Venkata Coppola, and the talk title, as we have it, is about uh, getting chosen ciphertext security for attribute-based encryption. Uh, but Venkata and I decided that if we could go back in time, we'd actually title it something a little bit more like this, which emphasizes just a way of going generically from plain, uh, chosen plain text security to chosen ciphertext security. So that's going to actually be um, the core of our techniques and also what I'm going to focus on in the talk today. Uh, I imagine most people in this audience are already familiar with the concept of public key encryption. We have a setup algorithm which generates a public and secret key pair where the public key can be used to take a, um, take a message, create a ciphertext um, with it and the public key. And then the um, decryption algorithm takes as input the secret key and can be used to recover the message. The first, the first formalized notion of security for public key encryption was due to Goldwasser and McCallie, who came up with indistinguishability under chosen plaintext attack. And intuitively, this uh, says that an attacker, if given a ciphertext of a message of its choice, would not be able to distinguish this from another ciphertext, let's say one of the all zero string. Um, however, time, over time, what we discovered is for in real life, there's more active attackers than one just, that just sits there and looks at ciphertext. And to capture these in deployed systems, we need to have a stronger definition. And the right one has turned out to be something called chosen ciphertext security, where we're going to give an attacker um, Oracle access to a decryption algorithm, where in the security game, it can de um, ask for a decryption of any ciphertext of its choice, other than the um, challenge ciphertext that it's trying to figure out. OK. Um, so over time, I think our community has actually been really, really successful in getting chosen ciphertext security. Um, you know, usually we started out with some number theoretic constructions of um, plain CPA security, but then over time with um, different um, innovations, pretty much for most assumptions, I wouldn't say all of them, for most ones you think of, we now have chosen ciphertext secure um, variants. Um, now one thing, uh, uh, I don't know what that little hand's doing. Um, now one thing, that we, one thing that's interesting though is can we generically go from CPA to, to CCA security? So I give you any CPA scheme, never mind how it's built. Is there a way to transform it or to make a chosen ciphertext secure scheme from it? Now there's some uh, what I would call um, minor, um, minor roadblocks to doing this. Um, so one, bar kind of weak, one barrier is that this earlier work showed, well, any scheme that does this generically in a black box way the decryption algorithm must call the encryption algorithm. OK, but I'm going to call that kind of a weak berry because, number one, you can. And, and number two, most schemes actually do do this, right? Like this, it, that get chosen ciphertext security, do something like that. Um, but ha in general, I mean, people, you can debate this a little bit, but for um, going from CPA to CCA generically, the main path or main technique we have is non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs. And uh, the two, you know, somewhat draw, so that, that's a great idea, of course, but perhaps the two drawbacks with that is, A, you need a NISIC, which they're not always so easy to come by, and B, the NISIC approach needs to usually prove something about the encryption circuit gate by gate. So this is a non-black box technique and tends to be, you know, not as efficient uh, due to this. Okay, so um, in, this, in this talk, I'm gonna, we're going to talk about going from CPA to CCA generically. Now, uh, however, in order to do this, we have a new approach, and we need one extra little ingredient, which is a certain type of pseudorandom generator that we're going to call a hinting PRG. So through the talk, I'll talk about a construction, and at the end, I'll um, touch on what exactly is this little extra ingredient we need to um, be able to make uh, the leap from here to here. Uh, in order to explain things, I'm going to build things up, uh, I'm going to build things up uh, incrementally. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is start with the CPA scheme and then go to another chosen plain text secure scheme. Uh, this one will have some of the structure we're going to need um, later on. And then I'm going to go to um, chosen ciphertext security one, which essentially means that all decryption queries must be before the challenge ciphertext. And as far as going to the full result, we're just going to um, punt this to the paper. OK, so as warm up, we're going to go from CPA to CPA. And I'll warn you, uh, on its own, it might look a little bit odd. It won't um, make sense why you'd want to just do this for a chosen plain text secure scheme. But um, the point is we're going to be laying out the structure for what we're doing. OK, so let's think of n as our security parameter. And to build our scheme, we're going to create uh, n pairs, or 2 times n, public, key and secret, um, public keys and secret keys. OK, so we're going to have what I would think of as like a zero row of the public keys and the run row. And we'll, I'll, I'll keep this. Um, 
layout as a theme throughout the talk. And we're going to also generate the corresponding secret keys. The first thing we can do is actually just delete. We're only going to need the zero row of the secret keys. So this is going to be our public keys. Our public key is going to consist of all these two times n sub-public keys. And our secret key will be n of these um, secret keys. OK? So let's, um, let's look at how encryption is done. Uh, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to choose a random seed s. Let's say you have m bits. And you're going to run s into a PRG. I'm going to call this h. And this is going to give you a value z0. So we're going to take the message we want to encrypt and blind it by z0, like XOR it in with, with z0. Um, now, for someone to be able to decrypt, we have to communicate s somehow. OK, and the way we're going to do this is in a bit-by-bit -bit encryption and also a, an ex, almost what you would think of as an extra redundant way. It's a little strange. So just imagine that for each bit, let's say the first bit, I'm going to encrypt, imagine just the string no. Um, in the, in the um, f first index and zeroth position, I'm going to encrypt a no to say no, the first bit is not a, a 1, and then yes, it is a 0. And then for the second bit, yes, it is a 0, and no, it's not a 1. You know, it's a bit strange as it is, but that, that's the way we're going to do it. So we're going to just keep on doing this bit by bit. In, in our slide here, um, we're going to imagine that n is four, 4 bits for presentation purposes. OK. Now, um, it, so that's an encryption. Uh, we have the message blinded by z0 and these sort of yes, no ways of encoding s. And to decrypt is pretty simple, right? You just um, you have all these zero keys in the index. So we're actually going to decrypt just using this top row and essentially just ignore this bottom one. And we can learn SI. If there's a no, I assume it's a 1. And if it's a yes, it's a 0. So I go through index by index, and I can recover um, S. And then um, once I have this, I can run S through the pseudorandom generator once again and, um, and, and recover Z0 and then recover the message by XORing it out. So this is not um, too difficult as it is. OK, and the security proof for just the CPA scheme is pretty simple. Uh, what we're going to do, though, and when, what's going to be useful later on is we're going to essentially want to erase information about S. If we erase information about S, we, um, we can hide M, right? And the way we're going to erase information about S is we're going to, uh, we're going to instead of, we're going to essentially add disinformation. So we're going to do a hybrid via CPA security to say, yes, it, yes the first bit was a 0, and yes, the first bit was a 1, and essentially say it's both things. Um, this is sort of an encoding technique that I got inspired from um, Gargan uh, Hajibadi from a paper about a year ago uh, where they used this, I thought kind of was a clever idea for trapdoor functions of adding disinformation, right? Um, although I won't go further into uh, exactly how um, they did their thing. OK, so you add yes, yes, yes. And, and then when the information about S is um, gone, uh, we'll kind of do, in the CCA proof, we'll do things a little bit differently. And um, then once the information about S is gone, we can use PRG security to hide information about the message M. OK, so that's a pretty simple proof um, as it is. OK, uh, of course, this is only just warming up towards um, chosen ciphertext security. So let's see how that works. Uh, to do this, we're going to have three building blocks. The first thing is the chosen plain text scheme I like the, with the sub um, ciphertext I showed you earlier. Um, we're going to use that again, but it's going to have this additional property where um, if you happen, to, instead of having the secret key, if you happen to have the randomness used for encryption, you can also recover the message. And it's not, it's not too hard to show that this property is buildable in a very easy way from regular CPA security. Uh, the second thing we're going to do is gonna, we're going to have a PRGH that's going to have this hinting property that I'm going to uh, talk about at the very end. And finally, uh, we, didn't, we explained it a little differently than this in the um, original paper. We're going to have a uh, commitment scheme that is um, equivocal. OK. And that's also built from pseudo-random generators. OK, so a bit, a bit commitment scheme is going to work as follows. There's going to be a setup algorithm and a commitment algorithm. The setup algorithm outputs some public parameters. Commitment algorithm takes as input public parameters message and some randomness for the commitment. It's going to be hiding. The commitment should not reveal the message. Uh, binding, it should be hard to produce openings for um, different messages, and also equivocal in that we can generate the parameters in a different way than the normal setup, which actually does allow a commitment to both a zero and a one. But the, um, way, I'm, the, uh, the way I create these parameters should be indistinguishable from the normal mode. OK, so let's, let's build the scheme. Public key, uh, the public and secret keys for the scheme are essentially the same as before. 
but I'm just gonna add the public parameters for the commitment scheme in there, otherwise they're the same as what you just saw. Uh, next, for encryption, the high-level ideas are in addition to encrypting the seed S as before, we're going to commit to it bit by bit, and then we're gonna add a lot of checks to prevent malicious ciphertext, or, may, uh, or at least limit the damage that they can do in the CCA game. And in, in, along with this, we're gonna have a more elaborate way of saying yes or no. Okay, so let, let's, let's see how the encryption scheme works. I'm uh, gonna do things as before, but also choose um, randomness for the commitments, so N, N random, um, so X1 through XN are gonna be uh, the randomness for the commitments. And when, <clears throat> so uh, we're gonna have yes or no encodings of S and bitwise commitments for, um, for each of them. So over here, we're going to have commitment to one, zero, one, zero, under the strings, um, under the randoms X1, X2, X3, X4. And now, in order to say, now in addition to saying yes and no like before, when we say yes, we'll kind of do yes, but then also give as the message the commitment randomness, x1, and x2, and, and so on and so forth. So the no values will be done as, as before, the yes values are gonna be done a little bit differently, and moreover, for the, um, we're gonna expand things even a little further, we're gonna imagine that our PRG, in addition to just giving us this blinding value z0, is actually going to give us um, randomness um, for the encryption, so these would be the z1 through zn. So here, um, the X values are the randomness for the commitments, which are the messages of the en little encryption schemes, and the Z values are gonna be used as the random coins for the, the sub-ciphertext. Now the no, the no ciphertext will also have randomness here, but it's just freshly chosen. It's not related to this, um, it's not related to this P or G value, okay? Okay, now let me, let me sh let's, let's see how um, decryption works just by example. So what I'm gonna do is remember I have the all zeros key, or, or I have the, the zero half of the ciphertext. So what I can do is I can use my decryption keys to recover what's up here. And I can use this to map into a, what I'll call a candidate S value. So if I see a no, I can say, well, no, okay, it's not a zero, so that must be a one. Um, and this one claims to be a, claims to be a, uh, a zero, so I'll write that down, and so on and so forth. So now I, I recovered S at this point, but I can't trust that the ciphertext uh, was, I can't trust that what I did was a good thing or can't lead to some attack. Instead of just using this S value, what I wanna do now is do some sanity checks on it. Now in order to do the sanity check, the first thing I do is I plug the possible S value, like at this point an attacker, for example, could have given me two no's or you know, try, try to, um, or give me a wrong commitment. Uh, so I'm gonna take this S value, plug it into the, PR, the PRG, get these Z1 through ZNs, and I can check each of them. Uh, the first thing I can do is use this randomness to try to recover uh, the X values to check all the commitments. So that's the first thing I'm gonna do. And the second thing I'm gonna do is actually, now that I have the claim randomness, I'm going to re-encrypt at least all these yes values, not the no ones, I'm gonna re-encrypt my, them myself and see that they actually match up with the ciphertext. So th this is um, actually using re-encryption uh, which has been used in other contexts like Fukusaki Okamoto and other ways in order to check um, validity uh, uh, of the ciphertext themselves. Okay, so, so really two sanity checks. Uh, you recover the X values, you check, first check the commitments, um, then you check the, at least half of the encryptions, the half that you can. Now you might ask, well, why, why go through this whole, you know, wh why, why would we bother going through this whole um, process of, you know, all these checks? And it really comes through this first step of the security proof. Um, as, I told, as I explained things, uh, in the actual scheme, we're gonna use the zero version of the secret key, right? Where there's really, for each pair of public, for each uh, index, there's a, one ver a zero version and a one version. I'm saying use the zero version all the way across. It turns out that after we do all those checks, what you can do is um, you can use uh, the secret key according to any string. Uh, these checks mean that attacker can't tell what secret key or what secret key half for each index you're using um, when you're decryption, if you do all these checks. So the first thing we're gonna do is actually, if we let S star be the um, seed for the challenge ciphertext, we're gonna do a hybrid step in a security proof where the decryption oracle will um, now decrypt along S star instead of the all zero string. 
And if it was succeeding in breaking the scheme before, it should still be succeeding after doing this, um, after doing this switch. Okay, that's, that's the first step. And then the second thing we're gonna do is change the commitments to be equivocal. So there's like, for each one, there's a coin x1 that will, let's say, open it to one, and a coin x1 prime that will open it to zero. So we're gonna then change, this is a high level overview, there's a little more details to these steps. So we're gonna have an opening for both the zero and the one. And then we're going to use CPA security to actually um, put that value in there. So this is equivalent to me saying, yes, it's a zero, and yes, it's a one. Yes, it's a zero, and yes, it's a one. I'll, I'll do this for each little part, adding this disinformation to lose, um, to lose information about S. Um, now, okay, at this point, it looks like all information about S is gone, right? Like, I, I, in, at least in the message space, all information about S is gone, and it looks like, you know, we're pretty much done here, right? We can plug in the same argument as before, and however, there's one little catch, and, and this is a little, this is a bit subtle, that there still is information hanging around about S in the random coins here, right? Because here, the random coins for this thing are just freshly random chosen, and the random coins here are derived from running this PRG on S. And if you follow it, if, if you follow it, you see this kind of, the fact that there's a zero, <coughs> it's a, in the uh, one position here, and the zero position here, and so on, and, um, and so on and so forth. Now there's really this, um, Lingering information is kind of annoying about S, and we need to get rid of it. We, we want to be able to go from that to something where they're, let's say, all fresh, um, all fresh coins. And essentially, the way we get rid of it is by the security game of the hinting PRG. It, it um, essentially it, it does this for us. Okay. Well, let me explain what these hinting PRGs do. Uh, we can think of it as going from n to n square n square bits, or n different blocks, each of um, length n bits. Um, so here's the security game. We have, imagine a challenger takes a random seed S, runs it through the PRG, and gives you Z1 through Zn. I'm gonna throw out the Z0 value just for simplicity. All right, then it also chooses ran, just completely freshly random blocks V1 through Vn. Each of these is n bits. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna swap Zi and Vi if Si is equal to one. Um, essentially here, we're gonna place the Z, the, the Z blocks um, according to the, the string S. So if the first bit was one, we're placing this one here, then we're putting the second one there, and then the third bit is a zero, so we're gonna put it up top. We're gonna arrange it in this way, uh, which re really maps pretty much directly with the way I, way I had the scheme. And the question is, can, can an attacker distinguish this distribution from one where all these um, two times n blocks are just uh, chosen uniformly at random, all right? Uh, and, and that's why we call the hinting PRG because the layout of where the Z's are are an extra, an extra hint. Um, so good news is that we actually, can we, we actually can generate these from standard number theoretic assumptions. We do it from learning with errors, computational Diffie-Hellman. Uh, the constructions follow pretty directly from some earlier work on similar, similar mechanisms we were using a laconic OTE or a chameleon hash, batch uh, th this type of work. Uh, but one differentiating point is those works needed some asymmetric cr cryptography at their core. Um, so while we can do number theoretic assumptions, you know, we could also just take an AES-based PRG and hope it's hinting secure. And you know, it seems like it would be, but uh, one, one can't um, get number theoretic proofs there. Uh, okay, so th this, this is an overview of what we did. We had a process, a new generic way of going from CPA to CCA security. And the only thing not implied just by public key encryption was this additional hinting PRG. And of course, it's pretty tantalizing to think, uh, you know, could you just somehow get that from public key encryption or pseudorandom generators or, or something like that? Uh, I, I, I don't, it's still kind of tough. Uh, and I like to wrap up by just tying it together, uh, tying things together, some other, some other works here. I mentioned earlier there's this work of Ahajibadi and Garg on trapdoor functions. There was also follow-up work to theirs that was concurrent to ours that um, improved these trapdoor functions in a way I think it um, appeared recently. Uh, interesting part about the construction is we recover random, we do, the, we do, do this like Fugusaki Okamoto or lossy trapdoor function or, or whatever way of recovering randomness and re-encrypting, re but we don't recover all the randomness. We, those no ciphertexts, we don't encrypt it. We, we don't recover it. And I'll argue this is actually a good thing. Uh, the limitations of our work is we don't get a trapdoor function, but maybe this is a good thing, right? 
like we don't want to run into those uh, impossibility results in, in, in doing it. Uh, the transformation works equally well for attribute-based encryption, which is why I think we um, kind of used the title that um, in, ended ourselves in the attribute-based encryption um, session of the talk. So almost the same construction. You could just plug into attribute-based encryption and it would give you the right thing. Uh, a neat thing is that works have already uh, built on this. So I think tomorrow we're going to see something on reusable designated verifier NISICs that need to uh, uh, use our particular CCA structure to get their um, to, to get the result is you know one, one piece of putting things together. Um, also, some work uh, not a uh, little bit later today uh, will show how they can take this hinting PRG assumption we had and instead use uh, encryption uh, symmetric key encryption um, that is key dependent message secure. And it turns out that since they do this, they can also get in addition to Diffie Hellman and LWE, there's also a uh, learning parity with noise way of um, bringing this framework um, down. It's kind of interesting. Uh, it'd be interesting to see uh, how, how that goes. Okay, so um, yeah, th this is this is the this is the high level picture of what we do, going from CPA to CCA with hinting uh, plus hinting PRGs. Uh, be, uh, obviously, one, one way of exploring things is to try to get new ways with hinting PRGs, or maybe use the framework. Maybe you don't need hinting PRGs. Maybe use the general framework, but uh, tweak some other parts of it. It's hard to say. And I'll just note another way there's been a lot of interesting progress um, recently, and it seems that now we have a new path. It, it, it could be worth uh, investing more time into exploring it. OK, well, th thank you very much for your attention. If you have a question, please come to the microphone. Okay, let's yes, thank the speaker again. Okay.